Hey everybody, I'm Josh, and today we have a very special guest. He is my foosball partner every time that we get around a table, but more importantly and slightly more relevant to this video, we have Wash Wetterburn, who is the product manager of SDK Systems Toolkit. Also, we have vice president of SDK Development, Jimmy Tuholsky. So welcome, guys. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Welcome, everybody. So we're here today to actually uh, announce the release of SDK 12. Um, and if you're a regular Yay. follower of SDK, you, uh, you know that this is our, our first major release in, in uh, almost five years. Not that the previous releases weren't significant, but this is the, the first one where we've incremented the major number in the release in a while. Uh, there are multiple reasons for doing that, but we'll talk a little bit about what's, uh, what's available in this release. Um, so if you're involved in aerospace and defense, telecommunications, automotive, or, or any technology segment that involves the movement of, of data and information um, across any kind of platform. And incidentally, those platforms are more likely to be uh, in motion today than they ha ever have been in the past. Um, and the quantity of data and the variety of nodes increases, uh, so does the obvious level of complexity involved in executing what we refer to as the mission um, under uh, what are non-homogenous set of conditions. Um, the ability to create the, the digital twin at system and subsystem levels um, not only increases the likelihood of producing a robust, robust design, it also provides the flexibility to quickly adjust to um, what are often ever evolving requirements um, as, they, as they tend to, to pop up. Uh, however, the, the true value of those digital twins um, won't be completely realized without an overarching mission simulation environment that essentially ties all those pieces together into uh, a, a synchronized um, or, or orchestrated uh, simulation uh, of the entire chain of events that defines that, that mission. So that's the continuing aim of Systems Toolkit or, or SDK. Um, SDK 12 is really a continuation of, of uh, AGI's mission simulation platform in support of what we refer to as digital mission, mission engineering and digital mission uh, operations um, workflows. Uh, if you'd like some more details on, on uh, DME and DMO, uh, feel free to check out some of our other video offerings on our YouTube channel. Um, and, and Josh uh, can point you to, to how to get to those. Um, at some yep, point. There's a, yeah, there's a playlist for them. They're all in there, so. Great. Um, so with this release, we've emphasized capabilities in some specific mission areas like hypersonic trajectory modeling, EOIR modeling. Um, but the bulk of the changes were really aimed at increasing the ability of users to integrate their custom tools and algorithms into SDK, as well as to provide greater access uh, to trade study tools. So um, with that, uh, I'll you know, highlight um, a few of, uh, of the major uh, themes of the release. First on the list is, um, is 3D tiles. If you recall in, in the previous release of SDK, we added the ability to, to do a highly detailed visual rendering uh, in our 3D environment um, with the, the uh, addition of the ability to take advantage of, of 3D tiles um, in your modeling environment. With the release of 12.0, um, we've now added the ability to use those uh, 3D tiles as a constraint in any of your line of sight analysis. So those 3D tiles can be tiles that you have locally on your workstation, or if you own AGI's geospatial content server, um, you can stream those uh, tiles from, from, the, from the GCS. Or also, if you happen to be a subscriber to Cesium Ion online service, then you, you can create an asset uh, collection on Ion and stream your 3D tiles from that collection and use those part of your analysis to do um, line of sight constraints. Additionally, uh, we've added to our ability to do lighting computation. So if you're doing any kind of uh, eclipse analysis, uh, with a ground vehicle or any stationary object in the SDK environment, uh, you're now able to assess the lighting conditions that exist for those objects. So you could put a sensor inside of a crater potentially, or maybe a ground vehicle moving inside of a, a valley or stationed inside of a valley. And you're now able to assess accurately the lighting conditions that are, that are going to exist for that particular object. For uh, communications uh, users, um, or whether you're communications or you're using our radar package, um, we've expanded the ability to take advantage of external antenna data uh, by adding support for the uh, FFD format within SDK. 
So if you work with any ANSYS HFSS output data, then uh, you're able to import those complex antenna patterns directly into SDK and use those as part of your analysis. Additionally, we've added a 3D component that here before had been missing for contour lines of various antennas within SDK. Uh, you're now able to display those on top of 3D terrain in a 3D environment. So it gives you another visual confirmation of the analysis computations that are going on in the background with SDK. For our, our EOIR customers, we've been on a continuous march with adding details and levels of complexity to the EOIR tool. Um, and maybe you've sat in on a few of uh, Patrick North, who's our, our subject matter expert for EOIR, um, has done several presentations on various topics surrounding the EOIR tool. Uh, with this release, we've added the ability to model clouds within the EOIR environment. Whether you have your own source for cloud data or you take advantage of the pseudo live cloud streaming service that AGI provides, you are now able to include those as part of your analysis. Um, additionally, um, previous versions of EIR existed as a, uh, a plugin to SDK. And with this release, EIR now has been folded into the SDK engine. So that allows users now to take advantage of automation capabilities that previously they didn't have access to uh, when it came to EIR. Jimmy, I don't know if you want to add anything to that comment. Up until now, it has been, as you as far as a UI plugin, moving it inside the engine is a big step for us moving forward as far as uh, the advances we can make on it going forward. Our API should be able to be much improved. We should be able to improve the usability of it. Um, we should improve the performance of it going forward. These are all probably all post 12.0, 12.1, 12.2 type of steps we'll be taking. But the fact that it's now inside the engine will make it much easier for us to greatly expand the capabilities of that product. Excellent. All right. Um, so in, in addition, one last thing, it should allow us also to expose it to Analyzer, which will allow you to do parametric studies and cover plots and things like that, um, which will give it a whole nother level of capability that we don't have right now. And that is definitely key when we talk about being able to support our DME and DMO users. Moving on to uh, Aviator. With most tools that exist for modeling powered aircraft flight, the typical assumption that those tools use is that you're operating with a flat earth and a, a constant gravity environment. For hypersonic trajectories, that assumption or those assumptions start to kind of fray um, as you get into those higher Mach, Mach numbers. So for this release of SDK Aviator specifically, we've added a, a full, full three gravity model that takes into account the fact that the earth is actually an oblate spheroid. I always love saying oblate spheroid. <laughs> And, uh, and, and has rotating effects, including Coriolis terms that have a, a noticeable impact on your trajectories. Also accounts for the fact that at the altitudes that most of these trajectories that we're talking about will, will be operating, you're gonna have variations in, in the gravity field. So that's also accounted for in SDK Aviator's hypersonic modeling capabilities now. For uh, some users who uh, take advantage of Aviator's PropNav library, we've added a Lambert mid-course uh, guidance strategy. Essentially, this allows the trajectory to account for changing geometries and target and intercept speeds as these uh, intercept engagements evolve over time. And additionally, um, as we mentioned before, uh, one of the, the primary aims of this release, again, is to expand the ability of customers to integrate with the SDK, the Aviator a API has now been significantly expanded to use the SDK object model, which now gives the user much more flexibility in terms of automatically um, configuring aircraft parameters, generating routes, and as Jimmy mentioned, being able to do um, trade studies. Anything else you want to add to that, Jimmy? No, I would guess I would say this was one of our last big missing pieces as far as the overall SDK object model. You know, the ability to control Aviator via um, Java C Sharp and make it look like the rest of our normal object model. Uh, we did have a previous undocumented API that some of you may have been exposed to. That is still there, but this new um, object model for Aviator is in line with the rest of SDK as far as units and dimensions and all that kind of stuff that you would expect in the SDK object model. And then uh, lastly, but certainly not least, one of the, uh, the changes that we made with uh, SDK 12 um, is that by default, users will have access to up to eight computing cores uh, in order to scale uh, their computations. And that'll be available right out of the box. 
Um, so if you're doing anything like coverage or deck access, you'll be able to take advantage of up to, up to eight cores to parallelize those computations. And then speaking of, of uh, parallelizing computations, that also applies to anybody using SDK Analyzer for doing trade studies. You are now able to, uh, in, in SDK 11.7, we added the ability to parallelize analyze trade study runs. You can take advantage of the additional cores there as well. You're also able to, to use uh, Python as a scripting language with the SDK Parallel Computing Server, which previously we referred to as uh, SDK Scalability Extension. In the past, you were able to take advantage of .NET and Java, but it's, uh, Python has become more and more commonplace um, within our user communities. Uh, we've added the additional uh, support for, for that scripting language as well. And that pretty much covers the, uh, the, the higher level or larger features. Obviously, there are lots of underlying changes that take place that allow SDK to to take advantage of newer operating systems, uh, allows us to do certain things faster than we were able to do them before. It also sets us up for our continuing evolution of the product going forward. So for additional details, we'll be providing or, or um, performing webinars in the future that will dig a little deeper into each of these individual topics. And as usual, you know, we're always open to feedback from our users. Um, as a product manager, I live and die by customer feedback. So feel free to reach out and uh, tell us what you think. All right. Back to you, right. Josh. Thanks, Wash. Thanks, Jimmy. And stay tuned for those webinars, like we said. Jimmy, you got anything else to add? No, just that there's a ton of features. I uh, hope that we, you know, we will go through a lot of the details in those other webinars. Um, a lot of exciting new stuff in this one. Like Wash said, it is our first one that's side by side installed for a while. So that should give everyone a chance to, you know, the, the, our current users to run your old version next to your new version, make sure everything is doing what you expect or better. Um, and like I said, there's, you know, hundreds of things in there that's been either addressed or implemented or created for, for everyone out there. Great. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Wash. I look forward to the next time we get to play foosball together. Hopefully it won't be too long. Awesome. <laughs> All right. See you, everybody. Take care.